Today's hearing is part of a broader oversight effort by the committee to examine U.S. policy options to address the Iranian threat, and this particular hearing will focus on U.S. policy and sanctions implementation and enforcement. Thank you very much. And now the chair is uh, pleased to uh, welcome our witnesses. Uh, we'll start with Ambassador Mark Wallace, who is the chief executive officer, co-founder, and former president of United Against Nuclear Iran. He is also the CEO of Tigris Financial Group. Ambassador Wallace previously served as our ambassador to the UN in the field of uh, management and reform. How'd that work out? He also served as a principal legal advisor to the Bureau of Immigration and Customs Enforcement and the Bureau of Immigration and Citizenship Services in the Department of Homeland Security. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Madam Chair, Congressman Berman, distinguished members of the committee, it's, it is an honor to have the opportunity to appear before you again today to discuss what is unquestionably the most serious national security challenge confronting the United States. Thank you for having me, and I'd like to acknowledge the important work of my colleagues on the panel, Mark and Ray. I'm proud that my colleagues from Iwani are here today, David Ibsen and Laura Pham. They and their other Iwani colleagues do the hard, important work so well. I must acknowledge the Iwani Advisory Board and the intimate role they play in our work, including prominent foreign policy experts such as Graham Allison, Les Gelb, and Fouad Ajame, and former government officials like former CIA Director Jim Woolsey, former Homeland Security Advisor Fran Townsend, former head of the Mossad, Mayor Dagan, the former head of the German Intelligence Service, Dr. August Hanning, uh, and the former head of the United Kingdom's MI6, Sir Richard Dearlove, among many others. I'm lucky to have colleagues like uh, Iwani's president, Kristen Silverberg, and European partners in the London-based Institute for Strategic Dialogue. The international and transatlantic character of our organization is a testament to the consensus belief that a nuclear-armed Iran is the preeminent global security challenge. The threat of a nuclear-armed Iran is difficult to overstate. If Iran acquires nuclear weapons, the threat environment that the United States faces will be changed in dramatic, fundamental, and irrevocable ways. With bold action, we still have an opportunity to thwart Iran's nuclear ambitions. We must seek the most robust sanctions in history. And we must consider much more than tweaks to current sanctions. We have made real progress. The, U the U.S. and E.U. passed financial sanctions against Iran's central bank and pressured SWIFT to bar Iranian bank access to the international banking system. And of course, the very important decision by countries to either ban or significantly curtail oil imports from Iran has been a very key development. The consequences to Iran have been significant. Iran's real, its currency, has been in free fall, a reliable indicator of the economic impact of sanctions. This committee has been at the forefront in championing sanctions, and I would like to discuss some concepts for consideration to achieve an economic blockade of Iran. Our proposed strategy focuses on four areas, namely banking, insurance and reinsurance, disclosure and debarment, and shipping. We give it an acronym called BIDS, B-I-D-S. First, we must fully end Iran's access to the international banking system. All Iranian financial institutions and banks should be sanctioned, and there should be no exceptions to the areas of prohibited banking activity. Moreover, any institu institution that engages in sanction workarounds, including participating in elaborate barter-type arrangements, should be penalized and sanctioned. Second, we must increase pressure on Iran through the insurance sector. Insurance and reinsurance companies that operate in Iran should be identified and prohibited from doing business in the United States and precluded from entering into insurance or reinsurance agreements with any entities in the United States. Third, companies that avail themselves of U.S. capital markets should be required to disclose the business that they conduct in Iran and with Iranian entities, not limited just to the energy sector or after some threshold amount. And if a company conducts business in Iran, any type of business, it should not be eligible to receive U.S. government contracts. Finally, international cargo and crude shippers that service Iranian ports should be barred from docking in U.S. ports for 10 years. Vessels arriving in U.S. ports should certify that they have not docked at an Iranian port or carried Iranian crude oil or downstream petrochemical products in the previous 36 months. Some vessels have also worked to conceal their movements, including by disabling their GPS tracking devices, and thus are actively facilitating the illegal practices of the Iranian regime. Such violations should result in permanent bans from U.S. ports. 
Some may say that the above measures are too hard, particularly on the Iranian people, while others will say that it is too late for economic pressure and that the only option is a military one. But Iran's economy is controlled by the regime and the IRGC, which profit at the expense of the Iranian people. This regime will never change course due to half measures. As for the other argument, I cannot under oath with certainty, state with certainty, that sanctions and pressure will finally compel the Iranian regime to change course. But before we would take military action against Iran, we should be willing to test the most robust sanctions in history. Doing so will show the regime that we are serious, committed, and willing to do what is necessary to stop Iran's pursuit of a nuclear weapon. But we must act, and act now. Thank you for allowing my longer statement to be submitted for the record. It includes our detailed bids proposal that we hope uh, may achieve an economic blockade of an Iran, and it's an honor to be here uh, today, particularly before the survivors of the 1983 attacks in, in Beirut, something that we all so frequently talked about um, as one of the reasons why we should oppose a nuclear-armed Iran, but to have these people in this room, is a, it, it's an honor for me to be here. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. A good question. This committee has really led in the area of sanctions and dragged, frankly, much of the rest of the sanctions uh, community along with it over the years. Um, and it's a problem we've been dealing with since 1978-79, and we've seen uh, really bad behavior from the Iranian regime, and we haven't dealt with Iran effectively through successive admini administrations. We call for something very clear, um, United Against Nuclear Iran, and I'm, I'm hoping to convince you all that it's possible. We have to have an economic blockade of that government. As, as Ray testified very accurately, this is a, a, an economy that is very dependent upon outside forces. We can do that. And our focus has been on banking, insurance, disclosure and debarment, and shipping, and importantly, oil. And if we say, no more banking, no more insurance, deny any shipping uh, opportunity, and force all Iranian businesses to disclose, and continue to pursue the oil embargo, you will see that economy continue to be stressed. When this committee did such important work on SWIFT, my colleagues at the table as well, we track, um, I have, uh, um, we track the, uh, um, the real, the Iranian currency. And when you looked at the precipitous drop of the real at the time of the, of the sanctioning of SWIFT and the discussion even of sanctioning of SWIFT, it was an incredible and precipitous drop. If we were able to cut them off fully and completely from the banking industry, deny them their oil exports in a fundamental way, continue to do so, and their ability to ship, have an impact on their automotive industry. We have a plan to, to sanction their automotive industry. It's a, a dirty little secret, but it's the 13th largest um, automotive producer in the world. It's the, f what, the fastest growing in the Middle East. It's the largest part of their economy other than, than uh, oil. We have to do more to, to sanction these areas of the economy. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Wallace. Unfortunately, the uh, global economic slowdown is giving us a bit of a gift. We see China cooling problems still in Europe and oil prices uh, uh, being somewhat deflated. I, we agree on so many things. I think we have a slight disagreement. I am less concerned uh, about uh, the rising co price of oil to benefit the Iranians. The market is already adjusting for it, and I think the market would explode if Iran got a nuclear weapon or, God forbid, there was a military strike. I do see a heightened sense of supply in the market, and you've seen commitments from oil producers to make up the difference in, in Iran. I think what we have to do is make a, as airtight as possible a, a boycott on Iranian oil, and to the extent that the, uh, Iran is buying, uh, selling oil to intractable third countries, they have to discount it so dramatically um, if we impose these other restrictions that they won't be getting the benefit of a rising oil price. You know, sitting here, I, I haven't chimed in. I, I do note you know, we underestimate the impact that our economy has in the world. The lesson, maybe we didn't learn any lessons of 2008 financial crisis, but one of the lessons is, is that what happens in America affects the entire world. 
And if we impose a true economic blockade with bright lines, it will have a dramatic impact. And Mark very accurately talks about these shadowy things that you can do on the margins of these very complicated sanctions proposals. I think bright lines of having bans on these certain sectors are the way to go. If you have a very bright line, transparent blockade in certain sectors, it's very much harder to break that blockade. In terms of natural gas, I think the focus is obviously on petrochemicals, which the downstream petrochemical companies have really dramatically expanded uh, their sales in Iran. We designated the National Petroleum Petrochemical Company in mm -hmm. Iran, but all the quasi-state and other state-related uh, authorities have not been designated. We needed to do that and stop the growing petrochemical sector in Iran, which has been a huge source of revenue. Thank you very much. I think the, the leadership of Iran, is, is, uh, I think everyone has said, uh, testified here today, is very fractured and is confused. But the regime has done a better job of almost any uh, very uh, dictatorial-like regime of permeating its economy with thugs of the regime that control its key businesses. So when we're actually taking steps to, to pressure that economy, you're not seeing any of the major businesses that are operating in Iran that don't have uh, that are either owned by IRGC or controlled tacitly or explicitly by the IRGC. And to the extent that you can undermine confidence uh, uh, in, uh, of, of, of their thugs, uh, you're, you're, you'll make a real impact potentially on the regime. So I think it's very important to, to hit these key businesses in their economy. Thank you. Very good question, uh, Congressman, and, and you, of course, uh, are aware that successive administrations have not adequately enforced probably what was good law uh, s from the start of the Iranian Revolution on, in terms of sanctions. But don't underestimate something, uh, Congressman. When you speak and ask me a question like that and call on mm -hmm. all businesses around the world to stop selling goods into Iran for fear of not being able mm -hmm. to do business in the United States, that's a sanction. You just sanction that government because when I go out and I challenge businesses around the world and I say, we're going to make public the business that you do in Iran and you're not going to be able to do business in the United States, you know what they do? They pull out of Iran because they want to do business with the biggest economy in the world. So don't underestimate the power, of I think, of, of these statements, but you're very right, sir. We'll, 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 Successive we'll uh, administrations have failed. Uh, we'll keep repeating them. Uh, but. We need to do more than just talk. We, uh, we, we need legislation. Obviously, I, I, I'm sure it's probably the consensus of this group. I don't want to testify for my colleagues, but uh, Iran's human rights situation is deplorable and it, it is not improved. Uh, and if anything, Iran, uh, it, when the Persian Spring, if you will, was the first of, of the of what you saw in, in the Middle East, started in 2009, um, and then what's happened around the Arab world, uh, Iran has shown that it, it is willing to be more brutal and more repressive against its own people uh, in order to retain its power um, than really almost any other government, perhaps Syria. But you have, as Iran would stage gruesome public executions of hanging dissidents, homosexuals, um, from cranes in public squares. And these were international crane manufacturers. And we've succeeded in using those human rights violations, uh, abuses, to highlight very restive mi minority population, 42% minority there. Uh, so it is a, a, a tenuous hold, particularly as this economic pressure has, has been put in place. We ran a campaign, United Against Nuclear Iran, um, we ran a campaign on uh, human rights abuses where we highlighted international crane manufacturers. One of the great methods of horrible repression, despite uh, what we think are some economic uh, measures that we can take in order to continue to isolate that regime for those very same human rights abuses. It's, it's um, not well known, but the Persian automobile sector is the 13th largest in the world. And as Mark testified previously, we have to do better at preventing inflows of products and goods, spare parts. Congressman Sherman 
uh, asked questions about this previously. And there are major auto manufacturing facilities and employment in Iran. This is a huge sector of their economy. It's 50% of, of, the, of the country's uh, GDP is in the industrial sector, and 20% of it is their automobile manufacturing. This is a sizable part of their economy. We've had some successes in, in having automobile manufacturers um, leave the Iranian market, the likes of Tarsan, Hyundai, and Porsche. But there are some real uh, gaping holes. Um, uh, uh, Peugeot right now uh, is a major uh, actor in Iran, major manufacturer uh, in, inside Iran in direct partnership with the IRGC. You cannot manufacture an automobile in Iran without it being manufactured by an IRGC company. Um, we all own parts of Peugeot because we own GM. And this committee has the ability to contact the United States Treasury Department, which is its major, uh, major shareholder, and say to GM, why are you part, if you're partnering with Peugeot, impress upon Peugeot that it cannot be the partner of the United States of America and also manufacture automobiles in Iran and sell parts into Iran. They've supposedly uh, slowed down their imports of a Peugeot uh, build kits, but we have to make that a permanent ban. Another example uh, is Nissan. Uh, a major manufacturer, actually, uh, I have a picture of, of the Ahmadinejad, I guess, Pope mobile or dictator mobile, which is a Nissan vehicle, um, where he's riding in a Nissan vehicle. Well, obviously, Nissan sells cars in the United States, and I don't have anything personally against Nissan, but Nissan is a major provider of uh, vehicles to state governments and governments around the country. I would suggest that, and I would respectfully request this committee to, to, to write a letter to our friend Mayor Bloomberg in New York. New York City just awarded a billion, multi-billion dollar contract to Nissan to build the most iconic American vehicle, one of the most iconic American vehicles, the New York City taxi cab, to Nissan. If they're going to build our New York City taxi cabs, they shouldn't be manufacturing cars with the IRGC in Iran. And we should be able to use the power of New York's pocketbook to impress upon our um, uh, Nissan to stop manufacturing automobiles in Iran. This is an important part of their sector and follows on what Mr. Sherman said, my colleagues on the panel have said, we can put a real dent in this part of the economy. Uh, looks like I'm out of time, uh, but uh, uh, Madam Chair, I would just say that if, if the, the federal government owns part of General Motors and General Motors is doing business with Peugeot and Peugeot is in Iran, uh, that's an outrage, and we need to do something about it. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you so much, and I thank the uh, witnesses. Excellent testimony. I hope that we can move on uh, stronger sanctions. I hope that the Senate uh, wakes up. I fear this uh, negotiations, May 23rd in Baghdad, just uh, a lot of hot air and a lot of concessions. we got to get tougher. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, the uh, hearing is adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Berman. Thanks a lot.